Sally's point about not just talking about the UK. I think it's very easy to uh, invite the, the person from the UK and say, talk about your problems, uh, as if no one else has these problems. So I want to, I want to talk about everybody's problems, um, because I think it is a very wide-ranging issue. I'm going to make three points to you. The first one is that uh, opposition to the EU, which is probably a more useful term than Euroscepticism, uh, is something that's become very embedded and is persistent both nationally and at the European level. And I want to explain uh, how that's come about. And secondly, I want to talk about how that has become part of the system in effect. And that if we want to think about the long-term uh, stability of the European integration process, then we're going to need to think about engagement. Um, and I, I'm going to offer some uh, thoughts about how we might go about that. And thirdly, I want to make the point that while sceptics might be uh, having a rising star, that they are getting a lot of uh, media coverage, a lot of attention... Uh, the only reason that I think they are as successful as they are is that we don't see alternative voices really uh, coming up to match those. So we need to think a bit more about the uh, development of a meaningful debate um, at a European level and indeed at a national level. There's always been opposition to the European Union. It's something which has always been there in some form or other. And if we think about any event in European integration history. It's not that everyone said, this is marvellous, we must do this, there's no problem at all. There have always been different points of views, different articulations. But what we see uh, after Maastricht really is the emergence of something much more widespread, that we get a step change in the level of public awareness about the European uh, Union, we see the emergence of different voices who are much more organised in a way that sits out of the broad consensus that the integration process has seen up until that point. And what we get now is, uh, in effect, semi-permanent opposition at pretty much any level of analysis that we care to look at. And I'm, I just want to share some uh, aspects of that. First of all, we might look at public opinion. This is from the latest Eurobarometer, which talks about positive, negative images of the EU. And as you can see, the blue line, which is the positive one, has dropped. The red one, which is uh, negative, has risen. Until now, we have effectively uh, equal-sized uh, groups in those two areas. And the neutrals are uh, also tending up. This is trust. Do you trust the European Union? Um, and for the last three years, which is the first time we've had this in the long run of Eurobarometer data, we've got more people who don't trust the European Union than do trust it. So public opinion, not just in the UK, particularly in the UK, but across the board, has turned more and more against uh, the kinds of uh, developments that we might historically have thought were very stable. Secondly, at the level of political parties, we've now got what we might term hard and soft sceptic parties across the board. So soft parties are ones who have conditional uh, opposition to some aspect of integration. Hard parties are those which talk about withdrawal, or something that effectively means the end of the system as we know it today. So we've got the classic single-issue, pro-sovereignty, UKIP-type organisations, which actually I'd say are relatively rare. Apart from UKIP, there aren't really many examples of single-issue parties. And even UKIP is developing a whole second issue. Um, secondly, you've got the radical right, which, as we will talk about, uh, no doubt, uh, is seeing a resurgence uh, across Europe, whether that's in Greece or in Hungary, or in France, uh, we see radical right parties uh, becoming more and more uh, successful. But it's not just of the right, it's also of the left. So uh, usually the more radical left parties, the former communists, some of the old school socialist parties, are not quite as sceptical as those on the, uh, the first two groups, 
but are tending that kind of way. But also in the mainstream, in the centre of the political spectrum, usually on the right, we're seeing scepticism becoming a more common feature, most obviously with the British Conservative Party, but also with people uh, like, uh, I don't know, the uh, Italian centre-left, uh, centre-right rather, who are starting to have these more conditional kind of positions towards integration. And that's also reflected in the European Parliament, which I'll come back to uh, in a minute, where you've seen a consistent growth in the size of an anti-EU oppositional bloc uh, ever since the middle of the 1990s. And that's a trend which I, I don't see changing, certainly, uh, in the near future. We've got a huge range of civil society groups, interest groups, pressure groups emerging. We've got uh, a European federation, not a federation, but a grouping of Eurocritical groups, uh, which has been very effective in exchanging best practice, sharing information, sometimes resources, uh, between countries. We see governments articulating more critical uh, and conditional positions as well. And then, obviously, we've also got uh, the media coverage. Um, again, I think the UK is uh, the most marked example of that, but it's also true of other countries' media that uh, the sceptical position is one which is uh, becoming more common rather than less. So across the piece, at those different levels, I think we're seeing the emergence of uh, sceptical oppositional voices uh, that uh, cover a whole range of positions. And I think this is a key point, that there isn't one Euroscepticism. Rather, there is a range of scepticisms in operation. And that breadth is something which we can see both as a strength, but also potentially as a weakness. Now, we can think about, so what? I just address this up in academic language. But so what? Why should we care? There, uh, there are two ways of thinking about this. First of all, we say, it doesn't matter. That actually, because it's so diverse, because it's so heterodox, because it's so marginal, these are outside of the uh, centre consensus, that we just carry on as before, and we don't really worry about them. It's, uh, it's grit in the system as we move on, and that people will sort themselves out once they see sense. The second point of view, which is one I tend to uh, tend towards, is that structurally the EU is going to become ever easier to criticise. There still isn't a great appetite for major structural reform, uh, notwithstanding Angela Merkel's comments about uh, treaty revisions. I don't know that her coalition uh, is going to be uh, very big on that. So we're not going to have major structural reform. We still have a very uh, problematic eurozone in terms of its governance, in terms of its economic performance generally. So the opportunities are simply going to multiply for saying the European Union isn't working properly or at all. So this is something that's actually going to build and build over time. Now, historically... Uh, what I've slightly provocatively called elites, have ignored those oppositional voices, that they've said, here is something which is nothing to worry about, and we should stick with the programme. I'd argue that this really damages the democratisation project that's been rolling ever since Maastricht, that this has been the big project of Maastricht, in effect, has been making, popularising integration, and a system that doesn't acknowledge the range of di uh, and diversity of voices is one that's always going to struggle. And the longer it is that it's left, the more likely it is that opposition, scepticism, becomes normalised. It becomes part of the furniture. That here is something which, well, it's always been like this, we've always been unhappy... Uh, it's going to become potentially ever, have ever more opportunity to become stronger. That uh, My argument, I think, really here is that ignoring the problem isn't going to make it go away. A few words about next year's elections. I think without doubt, 
sceptic parties are going to have their most successful elections ever next year. Um, the difficulty is that they, those sceptic parties will not be of a piece. I think we could, we could argue that there's going to be at least four sceptical groupings that will emerge. Obviously, we've got the radical rights, that in the wake of the Le Pen Wilders uh, love-in earlier in the week, um, that that's going to be the, the basis of a block. The radical right parties are going to do more than well enough, I think, to form a meaningful group. Sceptic parties, more bro broadly understood, I think are also going to do well. UKIP will have a very successful election in the UK, but you're also going to see sceptical parties uh, across uh, member states uh, securing seats here and there. Probably enough to uh, have enough to make a replacement for the EFD group that currently exists. The difficulty for the sceptics, perversely, is the success of the radical right, that some of their current members might well decide that the radical right grouping is going to be a more natural home for them to be. That the EFD uh, group is very much a flag of convenience rather than anything uh, substantive. Uh, one member once told me that the only two things they agree about are that uh, they don't like the European Union and that they don't have to agree about anything else. <laughs> third, third critical group is going to be that of the Conservatives. Uh, so the ECR group, based around the British Conservative Party, Potentially, they will uh, have enough to form a group. I think this is the most questionable. Uh, already, they had a real struggle to form a group last time round, but potentially, they might have enough uh, members to form something. And again, the uh, relationship to the radical right is going to be uh, particularly important in the relative chances of those two groups. You're also likely to have a new uh, leftist group that will, again, contain those uh, more critical voices on the left, which will be a continuation of the existing arrangements. But what will happen? What's, what's the likely impact on uh, European Parliament policy? I'd actually argue that it's likely to be relatively small for the reason that those first three groups that I've mentioned are unlikely to be able to work together. If we think about the three critical parties in those groups, which will be the Front National, the UKIP, and the British Conservatives, none of them will want to work, well, they certainly won't want to be in the same group as each other, because politically that won't work. So will they want to be seen to be working in concert? Maybe on some things, but I think on some others they will really struggle. So the sceptics will have a lot of MEPs, however they're organised, but whether they can form a, a coherent block, I think, is much more questionable. And it's also likely that if they do well, that the big three, the PSC, the PPE and uh, Aldi, are likely to form a cordon sanitaire and find some accommodation between themselves to lock this group out. So I'd argue that actually the success at the level of electoral politics won't necessarily be reflected in the uh, policy positions of the Parliament as a whole, which perversely will merely reinforce the process I've already talked about, which is that we keep these people at arm's length and we don't really engage with them. Now, I'm going to be unacademic and suggest some solutions. Um, what might you actually engage on? I've suggested some things here that we might think about uh, the way the EU communicates with citizens through its information strategy. We might think about specific areas such as fraud, think about the Eurozone crisis, other sexual policies, um, but also the bigger issues such as democracy, legitimacy, the whole nature of the beast. And as to how we might do that, we might think about more legislative uh, consultation, we might think about actually getting pro and anti uh, groups to spend some time with each other, education, getting sceptics to spend time in the Commission uh, or in uh, national parliaments and seeing how things work. Thinking about who can be honest brokers between the two sides because there's a lot of mistrust, I think, on both sides. And then more ambitiously, I think there's a need for public debate and then thinking about attitudinal change um, 
And if you want to ask me about that later, I will give you a very vague answer. So some, some conclusions then. Firstly, I think Euroscepticism is something which still is uh, seen as very marginal. However, it is something which is embedded, it's persistent, it's not going to be going away. And potentially the consequences of that might be quite marked. That the gradual erosion of the system is something which can have very uh, negative consequences. And as such, the argument that I'd make, uh, which I'd be happy to discuss much further, is that there needs to be an engagement with Euroscepticism. Thank you very much.